So it's take number 80. And if you recall, brothers and sisters, um, we commenced to consider the 16th chapter of the Apocalypse, and we considered in detail the first three of the vials of the wrath of God which were poured out upon the earth. And if you recall, we saw that the 16th chapter, as far as the timing was concerned, was set against the aftermath of the French Revolution, and particular had to do with Napoleon Bonaparte and his campaign, which was waged, waged primarily against the papal system. And this we saw as we went through the vials, how that each and every one was outlined against those that had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. And so we come to verse 8. When the fourth angel was to pour out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. So following on from what we saw last time, the vial of the fourth angel was poured out upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Now can we take you back in time to the sixth chapter of the Apocalypse, because we saw last time how the phraseology which is used for these vials has been used before, not because it's speaking of the same time period, but the principle involved uh, is exactly the same. So if you remember in verse 12 of Apocalypse chapter 6, under the sixth seal, John says, I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became as black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Now at that time, under the sixth seal, it was the eclipsing of the pagan Roman Empire to establish what became known as the Christian Roman Empire under the Emperor Constantine. And at that time, the sun became as black as sackcloth of hair. And the sun is always seen scripturally as the supreme light in the heavens and therefore speaks of the one who has the authority, the one in charge. And we've taken it back many times to the dreams of Joseph when the sun, moon and stars all gave obeisance unto that which was representative of Joseph. Now the same principle is seen as we come back to the 16th chapter. The fourth angel pours out his vial upon the sun, upon the leading light, upon the supreme power, the head one, the one in control of that time. Now, against the background of the 16th chapter, there's only one power that this could represent. Now, remember, as we gave the background and we gave the basis of the 16th chapter, what we are seeing is the eclipsing of the Holy Roman Empire. The whole of the campaigns of Napoleon, although he wasn't aware of it, was to bring down the Holy Roman Empire until, of course, the Kingdom of God could be established. We saw from chapter 11 of the Apocalypse that the 16th chapter fits between the second and the third woe. In other words, it is the outworking of the third woe. And the third woe trumpet sees that the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So these vials are the outworking, or the details, of that third woe trumpet. And that's the trumpet which is heralding the coming of the kingdom of God. Now the 16th chapter provides us the overthrow, or the downfall, of the Holy Roman Empire, and the 17th and 18th chapters give us the detail, particularly in reference to Babylon the Great. The whole of it sees the total eclipse of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, we all know the details of the Holy Roman Empire, as they were seen in the 13th chapter of the Apocalypse, under the symbol of the beast of the earth. You remember, it was dressed as a lamb, but spake as a dragon, and it had two horns because the purpose of the Holy Roman Empire was to bring together the state, the civil authority, and the church. 
And the way it happened, obviously, was, a part, uh, was Emperor Charlemagne being crowned by the Pope in AD 800. Now, what we are seeing throughout this 16th chapter is the victories and the aftermath of the French Revolution, mainly with Napoleon, to bring about the downfall of this Holy Roman Empire. Now, as we've seen in the first three vials, the prelude to this, in this fourth vial and then the fifth vial, we are going to see how Napoleon comes to the very crux and the heart of this empire. You will notice in the eighth verse, under this fourth vial, it's poured up out upon the sun, and then you will notice in the fifth vial, in verse 10, it is poured out upon, sorry, he poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. So the fourth vial is going to be poured out upon the very heart, the very power, the leading authority of the Holy Roman Empire, as it was at this time. Now I'm going to read to you just a portion from Brother Robert's 13 Lectures of the Apocalypse, page 134. Now he puts it very concisely and gives us the details of this fourth file. And he says, the history of the period exactly answers to the requirements of the prophecy. It brings the Austrian Empire before us. You must remember that the position of Austria in those days was very different from what it is now. Before the wonderful papal destroying exploits of Napoleon I, the Austrian Empire, sorry, the Austrian Emperor was Emperor of Germany, the military head of the Holy Roman Empire. The second horn of the two-horned, i.e. Pope and Emperor, or State and Church, beast of the earth. He was the most considerable member, the overshadowing power of the European system. He was the son of the system, whose light gave strength and cheer to those enjoying his patronage, and the withholding of whose rays caused darkness. The pouring out of the fourth vial upon this sun was effected by the victories and outstanding pretensions of Napoleon, who, after the temporary settlement of the Italian campaigns, which we saw under the third vial, adopted an attitude towards the sovereigns of Europe that led Austria to put forth her whole strength in a vain attempt to crush the formidable enemy which had sprung up in the presence of an affrighted Europe to the old order of things. The result was a war of great severity, spread over the principal regions of Middle Europe and subjecting populations to a great and a scorching heat of affliction. The occupations of peace were suspended, vast tracts of land were desolated, and countless thousands fell victim to the calamities of the time, which, however, as the sequel shows, did not have the effect of inducing enlightened repentance. Austria was overthrown. Peace ensued for a season. And that is the basis of this fourth vial. And the one particular point which Brother Roberts makes there, which we need to underline for those who are, you know, uh, up in the history, is that at the time of the exploits of Napoleon, the Emperor of Austria was also Emperor of Germany. The secular power of the Holy Roman Empire was vested in the Emperor of Austria at that time. So when all the wars which needed to be waged on behalf of the papacy was done, it was the Emperor, Emperor of Austria who was the one who carried out his will. The French, as Charlemagne had been obviously, the power had gone from them through to Germany and now was vested in Austria. And so verse 8, the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and this was the emperor of Austria. 
the leading power, the leading light, the head one, the secular power, the state power of the Holy Roman Empire. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. So great was the severity of the judgments which Napoleon poured out upon him, obviously under the influence of Almighty God. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Now, it's very interesting, the phraseology of verse 9, because don't forget, Napoleon had overthrown, in his country and other places where he'd been victorious, all the pretense of the church. And therefore, the war which ensued with Austria, men blasphemed God. Because from their point of view, they saw it not as God directing the state of affairs, but they saw it as the overthrow of the actual church. They thought God was against them because he was allowing a power like Napoleon was to overthrow the very vestige of religion. And therefore, they repented not to give him glory. But why should the revelator put that in? Well, can I take you back to the sixth chapter? Remember the fifth seal, verse 9. Remember the souls under the altar, those that had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Now don't forget, at that time, it was the pagan Roman Empire which had persecuted our brethren and sisters to such a degree that this cry comes up, as it were, from the souls under the altar. And some respite was given when under the sixth seal, Emperor Constantine came on the scene and championed the cause of Christianity. And for a period, a very short period, as we saw, there was some respite for our brothers and sisters. Then, because they wouldn't toe the line and wouldn't agree with the edicts which Constantine placed upon them, there was persecution once more. Now, when we come to the 11th chapter, under the symbology of the two witnesses, We've seen, and we saw at the beginning of our consideration of the 16th chapter, how that in verse 1, there was a reed like unto a rod given to the angel, and this angel said, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without, leave not, leave out and measure it not, it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now don't forget, therefore, that for this period of 42 months, 1260 days, 1260 years, our brethren and sisters had been persecuted by this papal power. Constantine started the persecution which was taken up by his successors. And it was that awful system, first as the beast of the sea, then as the beast of the earth, as we came to the 13th chapter, which had persecuted the saints of the most high God. Now what God was doing in the 16th chapter was persecuting that very system which had brought down so many of our brethren and sisters. In her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that was slain upon the earth. Now God was turning the tables. They had been used for his purpose. But now as we have seen so many times, he uses a pharaoh and he brings their downfall. He uses a Nebuchadnezzar, he brings their downfall, and so on and so forth. And now he turns the table upon the papal system, upon the Holy Roman Empire. And therefore, in verse 9 of the 16th chapter, they repented not to give him glory because they did not see that it was the purpose of God being fulfilled. They did not see that when his judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants will learn righteousness. Albeit they called themselves, in quotes, a Christian power. 
or B, they blasphemed God because they saw in this Napoleon someone who was overthrowing the very traces of religion which they clung to. They failed to see that it was God who was working through this individual, bringing about the purpose as outlined in the 16th chapter. Therefore, they did not give God the glory. But the remnant who were obviously witnessing this period of time saw the outworking of the power of God in the earth. It's the same with us today, brothers and sisters. I could take you to Luke chapter 21, and I could show to you the phraseology of the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things that are coming upon the earth. And yet you talk to people to say that the things that are happening in the earth today are the fulfilment of the word of God and they look as if you ought to be committed to the nut house. And no doubt in these times as in previous years, people, even people who have a profession of religion, still do not see the signs of the times as they are being worked out in the earth. And so at that time, although they curse God, because they thought the terrible judgments which were coming upon the Holy Roman Empire was very opposite to the purpose of God. They didn't see that God was in control of all events and therefore they repented not to give him the glory. Now, moving from the fourth vial to the fifth vial, we now move to the other part of the horn of the beast of the earth of chapter 13. We move from the civil, from the secular, from the national to the ecclesiastical. We now come to the seat of the beast itself. So if you think of that two-horned beast, the one horn representing the state, the other horn represent the papacy. That two-horned beast which became the Holy Roman Empire, the bringing together of state and church. This 16th chapter is seeing the overthrow of that system. We've seen the prelude to it in the first three vials as Napoleon began his inroads after the French Revolution against those that had the mark of the beast and that worshipped his image. And then in the fourth vial he comes to the very power, the secular power, the state power which controlled the Holy Ro Roman Empire, the Austrian power. And now in verse 10 we find that the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat, or as the other versions give it, the throne. They pour out the vial upon the throne of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Now here we have therefore the vial poured out upon the papacy itself, the very throne, upon Rome itself, upon the Pope and the very things which belong unto him. And again, I'll read a section very briefly from 13 lectures on the Apocalypse and we read from page 135 under the heading of the fifth vial. Now he gives you some details about the beast of the earth but we won't go into that. And he says, and I'm quoting from the top of page 135. The seat of the beast is Rome, but apart from which the imperial tradition was recognised. The papal element of the beast was always the most considerable, as occupying the traditional seat of the empire besides putting forth special pretensions to authority. The imperial element was enthroned at Vienna, the Emperor of Austria. But the religious element was always at Rome with the Pope, and therefore as he was, seated on the seven hills. Now the fifth vial was poured out therefore upon his kingdom, and he's talking about the Popes. And what could man avail to help? Napoleon raised an army which hurried into Italy with his usual veracity and dash and overthrew all the forces brought into the field against him. Darkness immediately set in order the seat of the beast. 
the Pope was taken prisoner and brought to France. He was made to pay the expenses of the war. The papal kingdom was extinguished. Rome was degraded to the position of a second-class city in the French Empire and offered the privilege of representing herself in the French Assembly in Paris by seven delegates. The cardinals and friends of the Pope had a dreadful time of it. They were stripped of their wealth. The ecclesiastical property was taken from them. The church is given up to public use and even pillage. Symbolically, and he quotes here from verse 10, they gnawed their tongues for pain. After many a prolonged and determined effort to throw off Napoleon, they accepted the situation and acquiesced in the extinction of the kingdom in which they had hitherto been the lights, but which was now full of darkness. Afterwards, the darkness passed away. The papacy never recovered from the shattering effects of the judgment of the vials. Although there was some revival for a time, it was a mere shadow of its former self. And finally the shadow disappeared with the full end of the 1260 years in AD 7, 1870, which epoch the Pope has been merely a bishop, a false prophet, and not a king. So what Brother Robert says, and obviously what is seen by the very terminology of the chapter, is as the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, so severe was the judgment of Napoleon upon the papacy, and they blasphemed God as they had done in verse 9, because they thought, obviously, that this secular power, which Napoleon was, was anti-everything that religious, and therefore they blasphemed God, because he uh, obviously had not gone to their defence. Now, with this, what Brother Roberts is indicated, and what we saw in the 11th chapter, the actual papal power, the loss of all his temporal uh, lands and his temporal power, actually occurred in 1870. But from this time of the, the French Revolution and onwards, the papacy was a mere shadow of its former self. Now, I'll say something again, and I know it's repeating it, but I'll just be brief. We've got to appreciate that the papacy at the time of the French Revolution was not the papacy of today. It controlled and dominated Europe. The Holy Roman Empire was still supreme. The Emperor of Austria was his champion, and he owned vast areas of lands and countries. Everything was done with the authority of the Pope. No man could buy or sell, save those that had the mark of the beast, or the image, or the things pertaining to it. That's how powerful and influential was the papacy and the Holy Roman Empire at that time. Unfortunately, because it's history as far as we're concerned, we never consider them in that light. But we've got to appreciate that the only way that these things were part of the purpose of God was they had to be put out of the way. God had to destroy the very power which this Holy Roman Empire had in order to make way for the events which we have seen in the past 100 years. It was necessary for these things to happen as a prelude to the time of the end. And that's what we're going to see in the next few verses of this 16th chapter. So to sum up briefly the effects of the vials, the first five vials, they were directed against the Holy Roman Empire. It was the aftermath of the French Revolution. The principal character was Napoleon. And he began these exploits, these wars, these battles which he fought over the period of years, mainly directed against the papal system, until eventually he came to the very heart, the very hub of the Holy Roman Empire, to the Emperor of Austria, and that was overturned, and then he went to the very centre, the very throne of the beast, to Rome itself, 
and took the Pope captive. And therefore the Holy Roman Empire was crumbling at its foundations. Now as we commented, I think, in the discussions last week, as far as the scriptures are concerned, that's the end of the exploits of this man, Napoleon Bonaparte. But secular history will record that after these things, which had been very victorious, which had seen him win battle after battle, sometimes against all odds, he turns his attention to Russia. And we all know what happened then. If we don't know it from the history point of view, we know it from the musical point of view, because we've all heard of the 1812 overture and the retreat of the French uh, army from Moscow. And Napoleon was defeated. His army came a cropper as they fought against Russia. And obviously, as far as the purpose of God was concerned, that had got nothing to do with what we have read in the 16th chapter. Whilst he was fulfilling the purpose of God unwittingly, unknowingly, not because he was aware of what he was doing, but whilst God was using him to fulfill his purpose directed against the Holy Roman Empire, the Napoleon was successful. As soon as he was left to his own device and turned his attention towards Russia, no purpose of God, therefore there was no one to help him in his victory, and he suffered defeat. It's very ironical how man thinks that he is all-powerful, all-triumphant, and yet he is a mere puppet in the hand of the Almighty. So that is the first of the five vials of the 16th chapter. Now the sixth one, in verse 12, we're perhaps far more familiar with, because it brings us up to our very day and generation. And so the sixth angel, in verse 12, poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. As we have said many times, and we all appreciate, we are living during the sixth vial period. The events of the sixth vial period are being fulfilled in this very day in which we are living. We are still awaiting verse 15. We are living during the purpose and the outworking of verse 14. We shall look at that in some detail. The spirits of devils which are going forth unto the kings of the earth to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. That is the very verse in which we are living to die. Now the effect of the sixth vial in verse 12 was that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. That was the reason and the purpose of the sixth vial. And it began with the drying up of the river Euphrates. Now, again, if we go back in the Apocalypse, we've seen the opposite of this once before. We go back to the ninth chapter, to the second woe trumpet. We come to verse 13 of the ninth chapter. It's the sixth trumpet or the second woe trumpet. And you remember in verse 14, the sixth angel which had the trumpet was spoken to and he was told to loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the effect of the loosing of the four angels in the river Euphrates was seen in the sounding of this second woe trumpet. And what did we see? Well, we saw in the second woe trumpet the downfall of the Eastern Roman Empire. And who was the one who finally dealt the nest toll to the Eastern Roman Empire. Well, it was the Turkish power. And we saw under the Second Woe Trumpet the overflowing of this Turkish power described as the one who had been bound in the great river Euphrates. And they overflowed their banks and spilt over until they dealt that crushing blow to the Eastern Roman Empire around the year of the 15th century. Now, we had seen that the first woe trumpet 
with Mohammed and the Saracens and began to eat away at the Eastern Roman Empire. But it was left to the Turks, to the Turkish power, under the symbology of the sixth angel, which had finally brought about the overthrow and the complete downfall of the Eastern Roman Empire. Now that was chapter 9. Now you'll notice that in chapter 9 we have the opposite to what we've got in the 16th chapter. In chapter 9 we've got the overflowing of the river. It was in flood because it was showing the emergence of this Turkish power to bring about the overthrow of the Eastern Roman Empire. Now we've got the very opposite. In verse 12 we've got the drying up of that same power. It's the same power. It's a Turkish power. But the sixth angel sees the drying up of the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And from the time of the fifth vial we began to see the drying up of the Turkish Empire. Now, if you'd like to jot down a few dates. I've got a few dates which I've taken from various books to give you some indication as to the overthrow or the drying up of this Turkish power. Now, just before I do, can I just read you a little section? Because don't forget, when Brother Roberts wrote 13 lectures, the Turkish power was by no means dried up. The Turkish power obviously didn't finish effectively till friend General Allenby in 1917 led the victorious British troops against Jerusalem and obviously chipped out the Turk from the land of Israel or Palestine as it was then. Do you remember that? No. But uh, Brother Roberts obviously wrote during the latter part of the 19th century before these things happened. Now, I just want to read a section from page 136. No sooner had the effects of the first five vials subsided as the result of Waterloo and in the death of Napoleon in St. Helena than the destruction of the Turkish Empire began. To realise the full nature and significance of the fact, we must go back to the days of the sixth trumpet, the second row trumpet, which we have, which brought the four Ottoman waves of conquest over Eastern Europe. Realise the power and terror of the Turkish name and the enormous extent of the Turkish dominion, which threatened to spread and spread with Turkish victories. Think of the power of the sultans, who were the most exalted monarchs of their time and think of their long and powerful reigns. And again, we emphasize, we think of Turkey today as a little backward country there in Asia. We fail to appreciate that Turkey, for a long period of time, was dominant in the Middle East. And therefore, Brother Roberts rightly reminds us, we think of Turkey not as it is today, but what it was. Now, in 18... 1820, Greece, which was occupied by the Turks at that time, revolted and in 1827 became independent. In 1828, Moldavia and Serbia revolted and they became independent and grouped together into a country which we call today Romania. That was in 1828. In 1829, Algiers, which again was Turkish dominated, was taken by France. And in 1842 became inde independent. In 1832, Egypt revolted from the hands of the Turks. In 1853, perhaps George might remember that, we had the Crimean War, which of course, as you all know, was between Turkey and 
Russia, very good. Turkey and Russia. And Russia gained quite a bit of the territory of the round about the Black Sea and the area of the, um, which now forms part of the USSR. And the victories continued and continued until, we all know, 1914, 1918, Palestine and other parts of the Middle East was lost by the Turks to the British power. And it's significant that after the end of the First World War, in 1919, the Turkish Empire came to an end and a republic was established. And today, Turkey has no empire like Britain has no empire. And Turkey today is a republic. It has no monarchy, it has no ruling uh, sultans. Now, all this was done in verse 12. The drying up of this Turkish power was for the reason that the way of the kings of the East might be prepared. Now, because it's recent history, it's modern history, we can all get books which give us the details of this drying up of this Turkish power. But I'm sure, I know we've said it many times before, although we may not have done Roman history or the history of the Dark Ages, I'm sure we all have done about the Turkish power being dried up. And we certainly all know what happened during the First World War. So these things we know took place. It's something that we know has happened upon the world scene. But it was all for a purpose. It took a hundred years to achieve. It started in 1820, it came around about 1920. It took a hundred years to achieve, but there was a purpose that the way of the kings of the East might be prepared. And we asked the question, why was it necessary for the Turkish power to be dissolved? Well, the answer is very simple. Who occupied the land of Palestine before the sixth vial was poured out? The answer was the Turks. It would have been impossible for the Jews to be resettled in their land, to be established as a nation according to the prophecies of God, unless the land was, got, was rid of its oppressor. And the oppressor was the Turks. And therefore, although General Allenby was doing it for a totally different motive than the one we are saying, he was fulfilling the purpose of God, the same way as Napoleon and all the other men before him, being used by God for the specific purpose. Now, I want you to come back into the Old Testament because I believe we've got a beautiful parallel in the Old Testament with what we've got in the 16th chapter of the Apocalypse. Can I take you back to Isaiah chapter 41? <coughs> Isaiah 41. Keep silence before me, O island, says verse 1, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak. Let us come near together to judgment. Who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings. He gave them as the dust of his sword and has driven stubble to his bow. He pursued them and passed safely, even by the way that he had not gone with his feet. Now this was a particular prophecy of Isaiah, which was directed principally towards one man. And the one man is described in verse 2 as the righteous one, or righteousness from the east. And he is called the king of the east or the king of righteousness in one translation but let's just take verse 2 as it says he was raised up he was called to his foot 
he gave him the victory or he gave him the nations before him and made him rule over kings so who was the prophecy speaking about well if we don't know chapter 41 I'm sure we'll recognize chapter 44 if you check the, the, the context you'll find that it's speaking about the same one verse 28 of Isaiah 44 that saith of Cyrus he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure even saying to Jerusalem thou shalt be built into the temple that thy foundation shall be laid thus saith Yahweh to his anointed to Cyrus whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaf gates and the gate shall not be shut I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight and I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron and I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden ridges of secret places that thou mayest know that I Yahweh which called thee by thy name and the God of Israel now we all know the setting of this 44th and 45th chapter of Isaiah the raising up of the Medo-Persian power to overthrow Babylon now we've got the way it was done in that verse 1 of chapter 45 or referring back to verse 27 of chapter 44 that saith to the deep be dry and I will dry up thy rivers and we're all aware of the way Cyrus accomplished the overturning of the city of Babylon you remember he diverted the course of the river and he caused therefore the river to dry up and he took his army upon the bed of the river and the gates which were to the river bed were left open and in one night Babylon was overthrown now we don't need to go into the history we're all aware of it aren't we we all know the way Cyrus accomplished the overthrow of Babylon but the point I want you to notice that he is spoken of in verse 1 of chapter 45 as Yahweh's anointed that saith to Cyrus to his anointed who right hand I have holden he is called in verse 28 of chapter 44 my shepherd the one who would perform all his pleasure now I'm sure again we've all heard or we've all done in our own study the type of Cyrus to the Lord Jesus Christ and the beautiful type he is we've got to remember he was a powerful destroying king he was a wicked evil despot but as far as this part of the purpose of God was concerned he was raised up to overthrow the power of Babylon and therefore he is called the anointed one the shepherd now I don't know if you've got a meaning of the name Cyrus but he's got seems to have two ideas or the Hebrew seems to convey two ideas one of the meaning of the name is one like to the heir not the heir on your head but the one who is the next in line to the throne H-E-I-R one like to the heir another alternative translation of the name is like one who takes possession of his inheritance by conquest like one who takes possession of his inheritance by conquest and we can see the idea of the two meanings one like the heir and the heir being the firstborn would normally inherit all things that is the one meaning of the name but it goes a bit further than that it's one who inherits one who takes possession of his inheritance but by conquest it's not given him by right just by handed down from father to son it was one who was given the inheritance but he had to achieve it himself he had to take it by conquest and we know how that happened now the interesting point as we come back to chapter 41 he is the very man who is spoken of in verse 2 
He is the one who is the righteous one from the east. He is the anointed one from the east. And therefore, when you think of a map, and you think of Medo-Persia, it was from the east that this man came to overthrow the power of Babylon. Now what river did he have to divert in order to take Babylon? And the river, of course, was Euphrates. It was the Euphrates River that went, went right through the city of Babylon. And therefore, the river had to be dried up that this man from the east could go in to conquer Babylon. Now that's exactly what the 16th chapter of the Apocalypse is telling us. It was necessary for the river Euphrates to be dried up that those from the east, and we shall look at that in a moment, might go in and take possession of Babylon the Great by conquest. Now it wasn't the river being diverted which caused the overthrow of Babylon. It was the army of Cyrus who overthrew the power of Babylon. But it was necessary for the river to be dried up to provide the way by which Babylon could be overthrown. Now that's exactly what verse 12 of the 16th chapter tells us. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. <coughs> Notice, it was being prepared exactly the same way as I'm sure many months and perhaps many years, I don't know if anybody's looked at it, do we know how long it took Cyrus to divert the course of the river? But he had to make all those canals, didn't he, to take the water away. But he took a considerable period of time for the river to be diverted. It didn't just happen overnight. And the Babylonians saw what was happening. They didn't realise what the effect of it was going to be. But they saw the gradual build-up until eventually the floodgates were loosened from the, the, the dam which had been built up to the side and the water was successfully diverted away from its main course through into these all these other channels so that the water was dried up that the way might be prepared for Cyrus to take his army into the city and that's exactly what's happening in the 16th chapter the way was being prepared by the drying up of the river Euphrates and the way being prepared was so the conquest of Babylon the Great <coughs> might be achieved. Now the overthrow of this Holy Roman Empire, which starts here in the 16th chapter with the exploits of Napoleon, ends in the 17th and 18th chapter with the overthrow of Babylon the Great. That is the purpose of the vials. To overthrow this evil system which has dominated this world for too many long centuries. But the why had to be prepared. And the drying up of the Turkish power was to prepare that why in order for the purpose of God to be continued to be fulfilled until Babylon the Great was taken. Now we shall explain how that happens in a moment's time. But I want us to look at the moment at this phrase, the why of the kings of the East. Now because you're all good students, I'm sure you've got in your notes that an alternative rendering is that the way of the kings who are out of a sun's rising might be prepared. Now there is a reason for that. Now I brought along Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. I've only brought that along because he gives a very interesting treatise on this word east. Has anyone got it? All got it? Right? So, I'm, I'm obviously under the word East, it follows the, the authorised English. And the word in the Greek is Anatoly, A-N-A-T-O-L-E, Anatoly. And it's the basis, the first part of it, is the basis of 
anastasis, the rising up, anatoly. And he says it primarily is the rising of the sun and stars, but corresponds to making to rise or to arise. <coughs> and he quotes the, the uh, scriptures and he says, in Luke chapter 1, it is used metaphorically of Christ as the day spring, the one through whom light came into the world, shining immediately into Israel to dispel the darkness which is upon all nations. It denotes the sun's rising, and therefore the east in general stands for that side of things upon which the rising of the sun gives its light. In the heavenly city itself, in Apocalypse 21, the reference to the east gates points to the outgoing of the influence of the city eastward. And therefore he's speaking that he's used in the scriptures in a metaphorical sense. Can we go back to that Luke chapter 1? Luke chapter 1. Obviously it's the prayer of um, Zacharias. Verse 77, to give knowledge, or verse 76, speaking of John the Baptist, Thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest. Thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring, margin, the sun's rising. And it's this word, Anatoly. It's the sun's rising. It's the east. Same word whereby the day spring, the sun rising from on high, hath visited us. Why? To give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. And darkness cannot live with light. We all know that from the scriptures. John, in his first epistle, gives a lengthy treatise on the way that darkness is expelled by light. We know it is a matter of fact, but he uses it from a scriptural point of view. So the Lord Jesus Christ is spoken of as this one, this day spring, the one of the east, of the sun's rising. And of course we all know it's taken from Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4 and in verse 2 and then you'll go five minutes? Three minutes. Malachi 4 and verse 2 Unto you that fear my name shall the sun of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, or beams as it should be better translated, and he shall go forth and grow up as calves of the storm. The Lord Jesus Christ is the sun of righteousness. He is the day star, the sun's rising, the one from the east. Now, put that in the context of the 16th chapter. The water was dried up, but the way of the kings of the sun's rising might be prepared. Now Cyrus was called the one of the east, the righteous one from the east. Now here we have got those who are the kings out of the sun's rising. Now we, brothers and sisters, are these kings. We are the kings of the east. We are the kings of the sun's rising for the reason that the river Euphrates has been prepared by its drying up that the kings of the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. What is the purpose of that way? What is the way which is being prepared for the kings of the east? That we may eventually overturn and destroy the power of Babylon the Great. And which is the one to whom the honour of the destruction of that place has been given? The saints in glory. Can I take you to the 17th chapter? Can I take you to verse 13? These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And those are the kings of the sun's rising. 
the Lord Jesus Christ with his saints who have come to execute the judgments of this which are written this honor of all the saints says Psalm 149 those are the ones who are spoken of in the 12th verse of the 16th chapter the drying up of the Euphratean power is preparing the way that they might enter into and destroy Babylon the Great and the whole of the rest of the outworking of the sixth vial is with that end result in view it was necessary as far as the other prophecies of scripture is concerned as we shall see next time for other things to be fulfilled but we've got to remember from an apocalyptic point of view the reason for the outpouring of the vials was that Babylon the Great the Holy Roman Empire might be eventually completely and utterly destroyed and the drying up of the Euphrates power of the Turkish Empire was so that that way might be prepared for the Lord Jesus Christ to return to the earth for the saints to be judged to be given immortality so that Babylon can be destroyed in the outworking of that purpose and we shall see how that transpires next time and so we're coming to a very critical but a very marvelous period as far as the apocalypse is concerned for us brothers and sisters we are seeing the very outworking of these verses in our own life and we've got to appreciate and something has to reflect upon the drying up of such a power as the Turks which took a century which saw many wars and many deaths was for the very purpose that the way for you and for me for those kings out of the sun's rising who have the honor to execute the judgments written all that has been done that the way for us might be prepared behold I come as a thief blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame